Hello and welcome. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us. My name is uh, Linda Williams. I am a community outreach and training manager with Consumer Action. And on behalf of the entire staff at Consumer Action, I would like to welcome you. I am so excited. I am pumped about the conversation we get to have today about how inaccurate private data leads to the loss of SSI benefits. And here to lead us in the conversation is uh, Kate Lang. She is a staff, senior staff attorney with the Economic Security Team at Justice and Aging. And Sarah Mancini, she's the staff attorney with the National Consumer Law Center. So buckle up and get ready because this is going to be a good one. Now, before I get too, get, get too excited, can't talk, <laughs> I need to go over a few housekeeping items. As the announcement stated, you are in listen-only mode but you can use the question function on the right of your screen to type in your questions. At the end of the presentation, Consumer Action Outreach Trainer Nelson Santiago will facilitate a question and answer segment. Now, this is where we get to hear from you. So please take a minute, find that function so you can send Nelson a ton of questions. The webinar is being recorded and it will be made available to you along with the PowerPoint slides and other handouts no later than uh, tomorrow afternoon. Now, at the end of the tra training, this is very important, you will receive a survey about today's webinar. We value your feedback as we work diligently to improve our service to you. So if you have a comment, a suggestion, or even a compliment, we would love to hear from you. So please complete the survey. And as a bonus for attending today's webinar, you will receive a certificate of completion. Now, before I go into further, let me take a moment to update you as to what's going on with Consumer Action. We are turning 50. Happy birthday, Consumer Action. We are celebrating the Big 5-0 on November the 16th with a virtual change maker conven convening with the nationally syndicated personal finance guru, colonist of the Washington Post, and author of What to Do with Money When a Crisis Hit, Michelle Singletary. It's going to be a blast. So help us celebrate our birthday. Please go to our website and register to join us on that special day. Now, let me go take a few minutes to go over the agenda so you'll know what to expect today. At Consumer Action, we believe in making learning fun. So we open up each and every training by testing your knowledge on the topic of the training with our most popular game, How Much Do You Know? So today, we have four true or false questions about SSI. Following the game, I will introduce you to our guest professionals in the order they will present. Nelson Santiago would come on and he would lead uh, the question and answer segment. I will come back, tell you how you can donate to Consumer Action, and we would wrap up, okay? So let's play the game. This is how the game is played. We have four questions. All are true or false, and they are all related to the SSI program. I will read the question. You will answer the question by using the poll function on the right of your screen. At the end of the game, the person with the most correct answers walk away with the bragging rights So, how much do you know? So are you ready? Let's roll out that first question. Just under 8 million low-income consumers including 2.3 million seniors, older consumers, and over 1.1 million children rely on SSI benefits. Is that true or is that false? Just under 8 million low-income consumers, including 2.3 million seniors and over 1.1 million children rely on SSI benefits. Is that true or is that false? Let's close the poll now and let's look at the results. 92% of you believe that's true, and 8% thinks it's false. Well, actually, it's true. Just under 8 million low-income people, including 2.3 million older consumers and children, rely on SSI benefits to meet their basic needs, such as food, shelter, and utilities. And if you want to fact check me, Go to the report that was created by our guest speakers on page eight of the mismatch and mistaken report. Okay, let's go to the second question, please. Do 
To be eligible for SSI benefits, an individual may not have more than $5,000 in countable resources or $8,000 for a couple. Is that true or is that false? $5,000 in countable resources or $8,000 for a couple. Is that true or is that false? Okay, let's close the poll and look at the results. 25% of you says it's true. 75% thinks it's false. Well, 75%, you are right. That is false. And if you want to fact check me, go to the report created by our guest speakers on page eight of the mismatch and mistaken report. An individual may not have more than $2,000 in countable resources or $3,000 for a couple to remain eligible for SSI benefits. Let's go to the next question. Okay, true or false? The average 2021 monthly benefit for SSI is $1,191 for an individual and $2,050 for a couple. That seems kind of low. Is that true or false? Don't overthink it. Okay, let's close the poll and look at the results. So, 74% of you think that's false, huh? And only 20% thinks it's true? Well, actually, that's false. According to the Social Security Administration, SSI benefits increase in 2021 with the average monthly benefit rate being $794 for an individual and $1,190 for a couple. Now, most states supplement the federal SSI benefits, but there are four states that do not pay supplemental benefits. Arizona, Mississippi, North Dakota, and West Virginia. Wow. Okay, let's go to the last question, please. Okay, folks, true or false? When SSI recipients appeal a benefit termination, they are entitled to benefits or A pending during all stages of the appeal. Is that true or is that false? Don't overthink it, come on now. Okay, let's close the poll and look at the results. Wow, 51% thinks that's true and 49% think it's false. Well, that is actually false. And if you wanna fact check me, pick up a copy of Mismatch and Mistaken Report that was created by our guest speakers and go to page 10, nine and 10. SI, SSI recipients may only receive continuing benefits during the first stage of the appeal known as the reconsideration and only if only if they submit the request for appeal within 15 days. Thank you so much for playing the game. Now I want to uh, move on to our featured presentation and introduce you to our guest speaker. Speakers. Our space first speaker is Kate Lang. She is a senior staff attorney with Justice and Aging Economic Security Team in the Washington, D.C. office, where she works on Social Security and Supplemental Security income related issues. She was formerly attorney at Legal Aid in Riverdale, Maryland, where she was an advocate for low income older adults and people with disabilities. In her previous position, Kate worked as attorney at the National Legal Aid and Defender Association and Bread for City Legal Clinic in Washington, DC. Kate, welcome to Consumer Action. Our next speaker is Sarah Mancini. She is a staff attorney at the National Consumer Law Center, or NCLC, where she focuses on foreclosures, mortgage lending, and credit reporting issues. Sarah has previously worked in the Home Defense Program of Atlantis Legal Aid and has represented homeowners in litigations in state, federal district, and bankruptcy courts. She also clerked for the Honorable Amy Togenberg, U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Georgia. Sarah is a member of the Georgia Bar. Sarah, welcome to Consumer Action. Now, let me move out of the way so you guys can get the beef that you came here to uh, get. So let me turn this presentation over to Kate and Sarah. Okay. Kate, you have control. 
Great, thank you so much, Linda. It's such a pleasure to be with you here today and to share some information about a report uh, that uh, Sarah and I, and also another attorney at uh, NCLC, uh, Chi Chi Wu, released earlier this year. We're really excited to share with you this information. So just a little bit about the organizations we work for. Uh, I work at Justice and Aging. We're a national organization uh, that, and next year will be our 50th anniversary. We were formerly known as the National Senior Citizens Law Center. And we use the power of law to fight senior poverty by securing access to affordable healthcare, economic security, and the courts for older adults with limited resources. And uh, we focus primarily on populations that have traditionally lacked legal protection, such as women, people of color, LGBT individuals, and people with limited English proficiency. And uh, Sarah works at the National Consumer Law Center, and uh, they have already celebrated their 50th anniversary. Um, they've worked for consumer justice and economic security for low income and other disadvantaged people, including older adults in the US. Uh, by using expertise in policy analysis and advocacy, publications, litigation, expert witness services, and training. And if you are not familiar with their website, there it is. It's a great resource. Okay, so I'm gonna start us off by doing an overview of SSI, that's the Supplemental Security Income Program, uh, just so everybody kind of has this uh, foundation. We're all starting uh, from the same kind of basic knowledge here. So uh, SSI is administered by the Social Security Administration. It's one of the benefit programs administered by the Social Security Administration. There are others, but today our focus is on SSI. Uh, SSI is a needs-based, means-tested program, which means there are a lot of financial eligibility rules about uh, what kind of income and how much income and resources individuals can have and still be eligible for the program. Uh, there are lots of other eligibility rules, um, it's a very complicated program. Um, and it provides for a subsistence level income for those who are age 65 and older, blind or with disabilities. And that includes uh, children and adults age 18 to 64. And SSI is paid out of general revenue taxes. And here in the box at the bottom of the slide, we have the 2021 monthly maximum federal SSI payment. So this is actually the most amount of, of money uh, that somebody uh, receiving SSI receives from the federal government. So in 2021, it's $794 for an individual or $1,191 for an eligible couple. Um, and as Linda mentioned during the quiz, there are states pay, some states pay a, a supplement um, depending on the person's living arrangements and whatnot. Um, but that is the maximum amount that somebody's going to get for the federal government. So actually the average amount uh, that somebody uh, receives an SSI is actually uh, much less because the amount of SSI that they receive is reduced by countable income. Um, so the average amount that uh, say an individual receives is, is more in like the $500, $550 range uh, because there are people who are receiving much less than the federal maximum rate. So most people are familiar with um, the other benefit program that Social Security administers uh, that's abbreviated on this slide as RSDI, that's Retirement Survivors and Disability Insurance Benefits. So as I mentioned earlier, SSI is provided strictly based on need, unlike retirement survivors or disability insurance benefits where there's no means testing. People who receive those Social Security benefits for the most part don't have to meet any eligibility rules based on income or resources. 
Um, instead, their monthly benefit amount is based on how much an individual earned when he or she was working. Um, and SSA uses a progressive formula for cal calculating the exact amount someone will receive, meaning that people who um, were low wage workers uh, have a higher replacement rate, have a, a, a receive um, more in, in, in um, will receive more uh, based on their earnings. Um, and higher earners will have a, a lower replacement rate. So there's a progressive formula that helps out people who were low wage work workers a little bit. Um, and also important to note that RSDI benefits do not decrease if somebody has other sources of income, they're guaranteed that benefit amount. And there's no resource limit for individuals receiving retirement survivors or disability insurance benefits. But on the other hand, Federal SSI benefit amount decreases if folks have other income that's counted, as I mentioned earlier, and there is that very low resource limit for SSI um, benefits. So just to recap, we see that SSI is funded by general revenue taxes. It's a means-tested program, whereas RSDI is funded through payroll taxes or FICA taxes that people pay into the social security trust funds when they're working. So it's an employment-based social insurance program. Um, there are a lot more RSDI beneficiaries than there are SSI uh, recipients. Um, there's you know, something like seven or eight times more uh, people receiving RSDI than people receiving SSI. As Linta mentioned in the introduction, that there are about a little bit less than 8 million people receiving SSI, but um, you know, over 60 million people receiving retirement survivors or disability insurance benefits in the US. So people are much more familiar with those benefits, particularly retirement benefits, but that's not what we're talking about today. We're focused on SSI recipients today. And now you all know that the resource limit for SSI is uh, $2,000 or less for an individual, uh, $3,000 or less for an eligible couple. If somebody has $1 over that resource limit, they are not eligible for any uh, SSI benefits. So um, if they have $2,001 in resources and savings, then they will get $0 each month in SSI until they get back down under that resource limit. So you can see it's very low and it has not been changed in over 30 years. Um, when SSI was started back in 1972, uh, the resource limit for an individual was $1,500 and then $2,000 for an eligible couple. And then it was adjusted by Congress once in, in 1989 up to our current resource limits of uh, $2,000 for an individual and $3,000 for a couple, but it has not been adjusted for inflation um, since 1989. So what is a resource? Uh, for SSI purposes, a resource is cash or any other liquid assets or any real property or personal property that an individual owns and could convert to cash to be used for their support and maintenance. And that means their food or shelter, right? These are very uh, subsistence level benefits that are really meant to help people cover their basic need for food and shelter. So if they own anything that could be used to provide for their food or shelter, then that's um, considered a resource. And a resource exists when the individual has the right authority or power to liquidate the property or their share of the property, right? They have the right to sell it. Or if the property uh, cannot be liquidated, the property then is not considered a resource. So not all resources are counted towards the uh, resource limit. And there are some very important uh, resources that do not count towards that resource limit. And the most important one for our purposes today and for SSI recipients in general is the home that they live in. So the home where they're living in any contiguous uh, property is not counted at all towards the resource limit. Um, 
Other things that are not counted are their household goods and personal property. So things like their appliances, um, personal property like their cell phone, things like that are not counted towards the resource limit. One vehicle of any value is not counted towards the resource limit. And then there are um, exclusions for burial plots, burial funds, or life insurance policies up to $1,500, uh, retroactive as, uh, benefits that somebody might get um, for up to nine months after they receive it, and then uh, federal earned income tax uh, credits or, or child tax credits up to nine months after they receive it. So that's very important right now where a lot of people are, are getting um, child tax credits each month and those are not counted as income and aren't counted as a resource for SSI purposes for up to nine months after they receive that. So this is, uh, there are more, but these are just um, the top or the most common ones that we wanted to make sure you were aware of for today's presentation. And then the other important thing to know about resources is how they're counted and when they're counted. Uh, resources are counted, if they are counted towards the resource limit, what's counted is the equity the individual has in the resource. So not just the fair market value of the resource, but actually how much somebody would get if they were to sell it. So say I have um, a, a second car that, the fair market value of that car might be $12,000, but if I have a loan against the car for $12,000, $13,000, $14,000, then I have zero equity in that second car. Um, so then I have zero dollars being accounted against the resource limit for me. Um, so it doesn't matter what the fair market value of the car is, it, what matters is how much equity I have in that um, in that car or that resource that might be counted against the resource limit for me. Resources are only counted once a month. They're counted basically at the beginning of the first moment of the first day of the month um, following their receipt. So the month that something is received, uh, SSA looks to count it as an income. And then if I still hold it, uh, in the month after I, I've received, if I've saved it, then they count it as a resource at the first moment of the first day of the month following receipt. Um, so things that I receive in the middle of the month, so let's say um, I get a second car um, today um, on June, uh, on, sorry, June, November 3rd, and then um, I give it away to my cousin at Thanksgiving, then it's not counted as a resource, right? It's only what I own at the first moment of the first day of the month. Um, SSA only looks at your resources um, in that month. So um, that covers the resource rules for SSI, and now I'm gonna hand it off to Sarah. Thanks, Kate. And just one question about this from me before we move to, my, uh, to the next slide, um, which I'll advance in a second. Uh, so I was thinking to myself, okay, resources, because of course, Kate, you are the expert on Social Security and SSI. It seems like resources are assets as distinct from income, but you made this interesting point about the timing. So if someone is earning income during the month, it doesn't become an asset unless it crosses over to the, the next month, like what's in their bank. Is that basically how it works? What's in your bank the next month? Exactly. So what I earn in November is counted as income under the income counting rules, but anything I save into December is going to be counted as a resource or an asset on December 1st. Got it. Yeah, and it's that's such an interesting timing conundrum. I mean, people really have to be on this to make sure that they're, uh, you know, spending their money in the month they receive it uh, in order to not run afoul of this, even aside from the issues we're focused on today. So that's... Yeah, it, it is um, kind of, uh, I, I say it's perverse that yeah. these rules under SSI um, really um, encourage people to, to spend and not save, right? Ah. They're always saying to people like, spend down, spend, 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 right. um, and not to save. 
Whereas that's the reverse of what people are normally told, you know, save for a rainy day, hold mm. on to your money and keep it safe in case you have an emergency. But that's not true for SSI recipients because of this very low resource limit. We're always, you know, hearing from people who have run afoul of the resource limit and our advice is always spend, spend, spend. Yeah. And it's so shocking that it hasn't been adjusted since 1989 and it's been that low. So it really, um, I'm, I'm, you know, I think that's important to keep in mind and that's an extremely low number in today's dollars. Um, so then moving us forward here, we, so Kate and I and my colleague Chi Chi Wu became focused on this particular issue, you know, taking all of this background information into account, we want to kind of explain uh, to you all what's happening with the population that we're worried about. So now that you understand the resource limit for, for SSI, you'll be aware that non-home real property is a countable resource or asset that could disqualify a person from receiving SSI basic income. Um, and so remember that the real estate that is the person's home is excluded. So it's okay for an SSI recipient to own a home that they reside in, um, and that will not be used to, to disqualify them from SSI benefits. However, if they own real estate that is not their home, that is a countable resource, and if they have more than $2,000 of equity in the home, um, then, then it will result in them becoming ineligible for SSI. And so when does this issue of non-home real property typically come up? There's a few scenarios where, where it might uh, come up in, in reality. Uh, one of them is a property that someone inherits. And I think in some ways this is probably the most common scenario of actual non-home real property that an SSI recipient would own is perhaps they have a family member who died either with or without a will, and they might have inherited a fractional interest in a piece of real estate. Um, many of you have probably heard of the problem of, of heir property or tangled title. There are many low income people in America for whom um, you know, their family members may not have estate planning in mind. And if, if that relative dies without a will, their own, the ownership of their home or land could pass to a whole bunch of family members um, and so oftentimes the person that inherits it isn't really even thinking about the fact that they inherited that home they may not have control over it it may not have been probated um, and there are there are reasons to exclude assets that someone cannot actually sell or dispose of uh, but but in the first instance i would say that inheriting a parcel of property or one chunk of a parcel of property is one way that this issue does come up um, another is divorce where someone maybe used to own a home but uh, it was transferred in a divorce or they moved out of it and there's this question of whether or not this ssi recipient still owns an interest in a house um, and then sometimes people have homes that uh, became damaged or destroyed and so the SSI recipient may not be living in the house now maybe because it's not inhabitable but if they still own it and it's not their home then it that it can be counted against them for SSI benefits and they could become ineligible so the Social Security Administration has a concern about people receiving SSI who are not actually eligible and they really devote a lot of energy to trying to make sure that people don't receive benefits when they're not actually eligible and they, they refer to this as you know a form of fraud or um, abuse in the sense of you know these are entitlements but if people are receiving the benefit when they're not really eligible the government considers that to be a very big problem and of course there's some justification for for overseeing the program effectively and making sure that people are eligible uh, but i think to some extent there is an overzealous focus on getting rid of overpayments, getting rid of situations where people receive SSI when they really weren't eligible. And unfortunately, what it can lead to is being pe people being cut off improperly. And that's really what we think is happening in a lot of these instances with non-home real property. So beginning in fiscal year 2018, the Social Security Administration started using this, this uh, electronic search engine called Accurant, which is sold by LexisNexis. 
and they use the one called Accurant for Government. Lexus sells a number of different products. They sell Accurant for collections. They sell, they have a few different Accurant names, but they call this one Accurant for Government. And Social Security decided, oh, we're gonna use this data matching program to search for non-owned real property that SSI recipients may not have disclosed to us. And that, that's how we're gonna do this to reduce overpayments and reduce entitlement fraud. And so they were, they were piloting it for a while before, but it became really widespread in fiscal year 2018. And so what they do now since that time is Social Security runs a search through this database for all new SSI applications as well as certain redetermination reviews. And those are specifically the high error profile redetermination reviews, which is certain people that they have identified that they think are more likely to have errors. They've really never disclosed who's in that category, but redetermination reviews do happen periodically. And for this category, the high error profile ones that they flag, they're running an accurate search for those as well. And so what is Accurant? It is this LexisNexis database that's actually embedded into Social Security's computer system. And the Social Security Administration employee types in uh, the name or Social Security number of the SSI applicant or recipient. And then the database creates a report that lists any piece of real property that matches the name of that individual. And through our investigation, we learned that it's it's returning a list of all real property that has the same first and last name on the deed or on any record that's connected to this property. It could be a deed, a property tax bill, uh, you know, but the important thing is that's kind of surprising is even though the employee of, of the Social Security Administration is typing in the Social Security number, Lexis is then triangulating that into the name and they are actually returning purported matches just based on a first and last name being the same, which is of course leading to an enormous number of false positives. And that's really what led Justice and Aging to start working on this and then NCLC to get involved, is that we were hearing reports from people all over the country who were being cut off from their basic SSI income based on supposedly owning real property because an, an employee from Social Security pulled up this search and said, oh, you're John Smith, look, John Smith owns a piece of property in Missouri. And this John Smith, the SSI recipient is saying, well, that's not me. Um, because if you just search for the same first and last name, there are enormous number of people that have the same name. And so name only matching, especially just first and last name, not even requiring a middle initial match, leads to a very high rate of false positives. So if, the Social Security Office concludes that a piece of real property is a match with this person, with this recipient or applicant, it is taking action based on that match. Um, and what we have been told and what we've seen in Social Security's policy manual is that they're not supposed to make a decision based solely on the results of the accurate search. They are supposed to, the employee is then supposed to do an independent investigation and they are specifically supposed to talk with the SSI recipient or applicant to ask them it, to do a, say, is this your property or not? And if, it, if, you know, and potentially do an investigation. But what's actually happening based on our report and our and the people we've spoken to around the country is that many, many times people are being cut off from their benefits or being told that they have an overpayment, they have to pay the money back because they were ineligible without ever being contacted in advance, without ever being given an opportunity to dispute this real estate and say, this is not me. So instead, what's often happening around the country is people receive a letter from Social Security that is the, the benefit suspension notice or notice of overpayment that has very little information. And a typical letter just says real estate and a dollar value that, that, that is estimated to be the value. They don't even provide an address um, or a state where this is located. And then the SSI recipient has very little information and very little time to appeal the suspension of their benefits um, or the supposed overpayment that's now gonna be collected out of their monthly benefit. All right, and so Kate, I think you're gonna pick it up here and talk about that appeal process and what happens if this happens to someone. 
Yes, thank you, Sarah. So um, I'm going to focus on basically what SSI recipients um, can do in their appeal process, their appeal rights. So if an individual disagrees with most decisions that the Social Security Administration makes, they can appeal that decision. Um, and the, the determination, um, uh, you know, this, this whole, um, as Sarah was saying, the accurate search, all of this is going on uh, by an employee in the local office, also known as a field office or a district office. So there are about 1,200 of these offices across the country. There are thousands of employees and the offices that have ac access and, and um, many of them are, are part of their job is to do these um, uh, redeterminations and uh, as part of that doing these accurate searches. So, um, you know, at that, if the person sends out that uh, initial determination, that, that notice of planned action, um, it has to say what that de determination is, the reasons for it, and the right to appeal. But as Sarah noted, frequently the notices are inaccurate, um, insufficient, and don't really give somebody very much information about what was going on. Um, and that's kind of, uh, the notice of planned action is forward-looking. Right, it says we're going to suspend your benefits going forward. Um, SSI recipients may also receive a notice uh, from Social Security at the same time saying that they were overpaid in the past due to the same issue that's resulting in their SSI benefits being suspended going forward, uh, such as being over the resource limit because SSA has matched them with some non-home real property. Um, so these are usually two separate notices, one looking forward and one looking backward. And um, individuals should file separate appeals, um, you know, based on an overpayment notice or a notice of planned action suspending their benefits. And then um, Social Security has a four-step appeal process. And the first three steps are within the Social Security administrative appeal process meaning the process is contained within the agency. And the first step is reconsideration, which is normally handled by staff at that same local social security office, but it should be handled by a different person than the employee who made the initial determination. Um, then if, if the person loses at reconsideration, the second step is to request a hearing before an administrative law judge. So if they lose at reconsideration, they can request a hearing in front of a, an administrative law judge. Um, in the past, those hearings would take place in person in an SSA hearing office, but they are now, now taking place by phone or video. The third step is review by the Appeals Council. Um, again, this is within the uh, Social Security Administration. So if somebody loses at the ALJ hearing, they appeal to the Appeals Council. Um, and then if they lose at the Appeals Council, then the next level of appeal is outside of the Social Security Administration to ask a federal court uh, to review the case. So you can file an appeal in a federal district court. But you have to exhaust that administrative process before you can go to court. So at reconsideration, um, it's a very important first step in the appeal process because if you don't file a request for reconsideration, you've given up your rights to appeal. Frequently, people don't bother to make a, a strong case at the local office on reconsideration, but it's really essential to put in the effort to make a strong argument at reconsideration because it, it is possible to solve problems relatively quickly on reconsideration. Um, but you know, if you don't really make that strong argument at reconsideration and say, oh, well, you know, it's it's just the same people at the local office making this decision, I'll make my case before uh, an administrative law judge at a hearing, um, there are long delays that can occur on appeal at the at, while you're waiting for a hearing to be scheduled before an ALJ, and the recipient no longer continues to receive their full benefits for waiting. Um, so for all stages of the appeal process, uh, the individual has 60 days from the date they receive the notice 
to file their, their appeal with the presumption that it took them five days after the date on the notice to receive it in the, in the mail. Um, so kind of the general presumption is um, that you look at the date on the notice and then you count 65 days um, and that's your deadline for filing the appeal. But you can show that it took you more than five days um, to receive it. You know, you may, given the way things are going with the Postal Service these days, sometimes it can take 10 or 14 days to get something in the mail. So you would need to show, uh, you know, demonstrate to them that it took you more than five days to get it in the mail, but then you have 60 days after you received it to file your appeal. And then even if you miss that deadline, um, there's always an opportunity to show you had good cause um, to show the reason why, to show you're an excuse. So, so um, right now, an, S, uh, an SSI recipient is entitled to receive continuing benefits uh, pending a decision on the request for reconsideration when SSA proposes to suspend their benefits in a notice of planned action when they file their appeal within the 60-day window. Now, Linda had mentioned earlier that uh, people uh, had 15 days, basically 10 days plus a five-day uh, presumption that they received it uh, through the mail um, to file an appeal and get benefit continuation. But just last week, uh, Social Security um, uh, published some new guidelines, uh, some new guidance to their employees saying that um, uh, an SSI recipient, if they file their appeal on a notice of planned action, suspending their benefits, if they file that request for reconsideration within the 65-day appeal window, they will get their benefits continuing. So this is a really great development, and um, I can try later to share the link to that guidance on the SSA website in the chat so people have access to it, because that's a very important development for people to be aware of. So when they file their request for reconsideration, SSI recipients have basically three types of review to choose from, uh, case review, informal conference, or formal conference. Uh, we recommend that people um, go, go with formal conference or informal conference, uh, because the first option, case review, is just a paper record review and it doesn't involve an opportunity to present uh, our, an argument to the decision maker. Whereas with an informal conference or a formal conference, uh, the new decision maker hear, can hear testimony or an argument from witnesses and review new documents, and a written summary of that conference bec um, becomes part of the case record. Um, those are being conducted by phone now while local offices continue to be closed uh, for the pandemic. And really the main difference between an informal conference and a formal conference is that at a formal conference, you can ask for the agency to subpoena witnesses or documents uh, to, to, uh, for the conference. So I wanna let people know about an opportunity to file a request for reconsideration online. So uh, a non-medical appeal, um, you know, involving uh, somebody's benefits being suspended, for example, for being over the resource limit, or if they get a notice of overpayment for being over the resource limit, you can request reconsideration uh, online. And here is the, uh, and you can also request for the hearing by an ALJ at the same website, uh, depending on which level you're at. But you would start your appeal with a request for reconsideration. And then if you lost your uh, request for reconsideration, you re request an ALJ hearing. And um, here is the website where you can go to start um, and file that appeal. You know, because local offices are, are closed and people cannot just go, uh, go and walk in to file their appeal, this can really be the quickest way for somebody to start an appeal. And then once you have filed the appeal online, you then can print out a confirmation showing the date when you filed that appeal using the online system. So we encourage people to use uh, that online filing system if possible. 
you know, it's also possible to fax it into them. Um, it needs to be in writing, right? It's not considered sufficient to just call them up. If you call them up, they are gonna say, okay, I'm gonna mail you the appeal form and you have to wait for the, uh, the appeal form to show up in the mail and then you have to complete it and mail it back. That can be, you know, 10, 20 days of delay. And if you're coming up against the deadline and you just wanna make sure you get the appeal filed within that 65 day window, this can be a, you know, a really great uh, way to make sure your appeal is filed on time. So we wanna take some time here to talk about um, the individuals, the SSI recipients that we talked to um, who were harmed by SSA's use of this accurate for government uh, data matching. So first I wanna talk with you about Teresa Sims. Uh, she's an African-American woman with disabilities and she's in her 30s. She lives in a group home in the Twin Cities in Minnesota. And she's been on SSI since she was a child. And in March of 2018, she uh, got a letter, uh, a notice of planned action from Social Security saying that as of April 1st of 2018, she would no longer receive any SSI benefits because they said she was over the resource limit. Um, and it said that she had failed to disclose uh, this property to SSA and all the decades that she had been receiving SSI. So among those alleged uh, assets were three pieces of real property located in this county in Minnesota. I'm not even sure how to, uh, I'm not familiar with how to pronounce that, but it was about six hours away from where she was living in the Twin Cities in the far northern part of Minnesota. So because she had been on SSI since she was a child, uh, SSA had her address history and it knew she had never lived in that county. In fact, she had never even traveled to that county and these properties did not belong to this Teresa Sims. It took her a few weeks to get help with the problem and to show the letter to one of the employees at her group home and they helped her uh, get connected with a legal services attorney, uh, Russell Squire at, at Southern Minnesota Regional Legal Services, and he represented her in the appeal. He was able to show good cause for late filing on um, her request for reconsideration. Um, but her SSI benefits had already been cut off for a couple of months at that point, and she was too late to obtain continuing benefits while her request for reconsideration was pending. So then in May, uh, her attorney helped her um, file that request for reconsideration. And then at the end of June, SSA sent a letter saying, we got your request for reconsideration and we're asking for proof that these properties do not belong to you. So they put the burden on the SSI recipient to prove to them that it was not her property. She had to prove a negative. So fortunately, Mr. Squires was very diligent and he found the record, he just went through all these uh, property records and he found um, that the properties were owned by a Harold and Teresa Sims. And then he found that there was a marriage between Harold Sims and Teresa Arnold in 1990. And he drafted an affidavit that Ms. Sims signed um, and included all of these documents and uh, sent that to Social Security in August. Um, and then, uh, oh, I guess that's affidavit was in July. And then uh, SSA responded in August saying, um, this was insufficient. You did not provide sufficient proof that we requested in order to make a decision. So uh, Mr. Squires persisted. He sub continued to submit property records, tax records, all sorts of um, pr property tax records that he researched. And this went on uh, for several months until finally October of 2018, they accepted the documentation that he provided and turned on her benefits. So she was out without her SSI for six months. Um, she lost her Medicaid as a result for those six months. Um, and there were all sorts of problems. You know, she said it was so stressful. I'm surprised I didn't have a panic attack. Um, and her attorney said, you know, it, considering the consequences for her, it should require a much higher uh, standard of accuracy 
how did they expect a seriously disabled individual to prove a negative like this? Um, if she had not had the assistance of her attorney, it's unlikely she could have ever prevailed in convincing the Social Security Administration to reinstate her benefits. And this really shows how crucial it was in her circumstance to have the help of an attorney, but really, you know, nine, uh, close to 90% of low-income people do not have access to uh, civil legal aid in, in uh, matters like this. And then um, I want to tell you about uh, Francis Harmon in Pennsylvania. In the spring of, uh, well, a little bit about her first. She's an African-American woman living in South Philadelphia where she's lived her whole life. And she applied for SSI when she became disabled around uh, 2008, uh, when she was in her late 40s. And then in uh, spring of 2019, she received a, a notice of planned action from her local security office saying that she owned, they thought she owned some real property where she was not living and she needed to contact them regarding this issue. And the property at issue was in Missouri. So her daughter tried to help out and called the local office and said, you know, we don't know anything about this property in Missouri. And the SSA employee said, you need more evidence that this isn't her. Uh, just saying you don't know anything about it is not sufficient. Um, so again, she was very stressed out. Um, she was very fearful that she was going to lose her SSI, and she reached out to Community Legal Services in Philadelphia. And an attorney there, Pam Waltz, helped um, her and, and contacted Social Security uh, at the local office immediately and said, you know, this is not her property. And the SSA employee was like, oh, yeah, okay, we're, we're taking that property off her record um, and said that they had done so based on the earlier phone call from her daughter, but that's not what her daughter heard. Um, you know, that's not what they had told her daughter on the phone. Um, and Ms. Harmon says, you know, oh, they said we took care of it, but they didn't take care of it. Um, they told my daughter she had to take care of it and I had to get the lawyer involved. So it appears that the agency handled things very differently once they got a call from an attorney. Um, and then I'm gonna hand it off to Sarah. Sure, yep. Yeah. So I'm gonna talk about two more examples. Oops, I went ahead too far. So um, the next story that we wanted to uh, relay to you all that we heard from this client, um, and this is a pseudonym because this client asked for her uh, real name not to be used to protect her privacy, but Laura Marshall is a 74-year-old Hispanic woman who lives in Harlem. Um, she has anxiety and depression, and in December of 2018, she received a letter from Social Security telling, saying that she owed the federal government over $10,000 because supposedly she had received SSI benefits when she was over the resource limit because they claimed she owned real estate in New Jersey, Washington, D.C., and Massachusetts. Now, for Ms. Marshall, the property in New Jersey was her daughter's home, and she actually had been a co-signer on the mortgage for the home when it was purchased, but she had never been on title. So she had never actually been an owner of that home. And she was able to get documentation from her daughter proving that, that she was not actually a joint owner of that house. So that house, house did have some connection to her, but it was not really her asset. Um, and then the Washington DC and Massachusetts houses had nothing to do with her. She attempted to solve this problem on her own. She repeatedly reached out to her local social security office um, by phone and even went to the office in person. And the representatives kept telling her that there was nothing they could do. Her daughter also tried to help her and tried to research the properties. Um, and again, social security employees said that it wasn't good enough. And in fact, uh, one of the people at the Social Security office said, you need to get a lawyer, um, but did not give her any information about how to get legal assistance. So really troubling. Ultimately, fortunately, Ms. Marshall was able to get representation from the New York Legal Assistance Group. Um, and that advocate uh, was able to convince Social Security that these properties had nothing to do with Ms. Marshall. Um, and, and how fortunate for that, because Ms. Marshall was extremely distressed by this experience and and uh you know 
the fact that she lost her income, she could barely pay her rent. And if this is already an individual struggling with mental health disabilities, who really said that without, if she hadn't gotten help, this could have driven her to, to take her own life. So the, you know, the issues here, the importance of this problem and trying to solve this problem really can't be overstated because of the human impact that it's having on very vulnerable SSI recipients. Um, so the next uh, and the final of the four examples we wanted to describe to you is Nam T. Tron, who lives in San Jose, California. Um, she received a notice of planned action uh, also in 2018, telling her that her SSI benefits were being suspended because she supposedly was an owner of, of real estate that was described as being worth over $300,000. Of course, Ms. Tron had no idea what, what this had to do with. She was not aware of any real estate that she owned. Um, and she attempted to solve the situation on her own, spoke with the Social Security local office and was told the address. And she said, I have nothing to do with this property. This is not me. And I will tell you that this name, that Ms. Tran is Vietnamese, and this is apparently a very common name in the Vietnamese community, and there is a large Vietnamese population in San Jose, California. And that really exemplifies one of the common threads that we observed in doing this report, is that it really does, this problem of using name-only matching in the reports disparately impacts immigrants and people of color, which are communities in which there are certain common names that are more frequent, where just relying on a name only match would be even more likely to give you a, a false positive. Ms. Tran also had to get help from an attorney. She was unable to solve this problem on her own. Um, and her attorney even had to go multiple rounds with social security. First, when the attorney researched it, was able to find on the deed that this property was jointly owned with another person as community property, which in California is a state of ownership you can only have with someone you're married to. And the other name on this deed was not Ms. Tran's spouse. And the attorney explained that to Social Security and, and was trying to explain community property and, and, and the employee you know, basically said, well, this is not enough. Um, but after some additional advocacy was finally able to get it corrected. But it really took a lot of um, advocacy. And so these are, the four that we've talked through in detail are just a small sampling of the individuals um, that we heard from and, and mostly we spoke with legal services attorneys from around the country who had represented uh, SSI recipients that had to try to straighten out these problems. We overall spoke with over 16, heard about over 16 examples from around the country from different time periods and we found that these problems are very common. And some of the, the common themes that we observed are, first of all, the, the difficulty and really impossibility of proving a negative. And I think the Teresa Sims example is a, is a great example of this because, uh, you know, she was told, and, and really all of these individuals were told, even though this is your same name and you're telling us you don't own it, you have to somehow prove to us, prove to Social Security that this is not you, that this is a different Teresa Sims. Um, and, and it's really difficult to do that and especially difficult for a low income person, elderly or disabled, who doesn't have access to uh, the deed records necessarily or to various uh, records that you have to pay to have access to or have an account um, so it's really an impossible burden to put on SSI recipients. We noticed that a, a lot of times um, there were people who had family members with similar names. And as I mentioned before, immigrants and people of color, um, there were several other examples. There was a Bengali individual in New York who uh, was told, oh, you own this property in Florida. There was a limited English proficient client. Um, in her 50s, who was told that she had recently purchased real estate, which was not true. So it really is impacting limited English proficient and immigrant communities uh, to a significant extent and other people of color. There were examples of people who had owned property many, many years ago, like 20 years ago, and the property came up in the search and it should not have counted against them because they transferred away their ownership a, a very long time ago. There is a look back period for assets that are transferred away for less than fair market value. But you know, we heard of examples of people who had transferred their property 20 years ago or was settled in a divorce 20 years ago, and yet it was still coming up in this search, and that should not have been an, an issue. Um, 
or properties that really didn't have a value that would have exceeded the resource limit because the property had been destroyed through a hurricane or other, you know, other problems. Um, but yet people were being kicked off of their SSI benefits improperly. And another common thread was that by and large, almost all of the people we learned about had not been given an opportunity to uh, provide information to Social Security before they were suspended from their benefits or hit with an overpayment. And, and so Social Security was taking the negative action solely based on the information in the accurate report. So one thing that we wanted to highlight in this report is obviously this practice is a problem for so many reasons and there are due process issues, there are fairness issues, this is just not the country that we should be, um, but also we believe it violates the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which is a federal law. And I wanna to explain to you why we think uh, that the conduct that's happening here is prohibited by the Fair Credit Reporting Act. The Fair Credit Reporting Act applies to consumer reports. So it's broader than just credit reports. Many people, when they hear Fair Credit Reporting Act, they think it's just about your credit reports from Equifax, Experian, or TransUnion. But in fact, the statute covers all consumer reports, which is very broadly defined and includes things like background checks that are used for employment purposes and tenant screening reports uh, that are used by landlords. So I do just want to mention to folks that the Fair Credit Reporting Act has some really powerful protections for these other kinds of data reports that may be impacting your low income clients. And the National Consumer Law Center does a lot of work on the Fair Credit Reporting Act, and we have materials on our website, nclc.org. So if you're dealing with these other types of consumer reports, like background checks or tenant screening reports, especially now during the pandemic with so many tenants getting evicted, those things are covered by the Fair Credit Reporting Act, and there may be um, other protections that you can bring to bear for your clients. But here, Broadly, the question we're faced with is, is this accurate report a consumer report covered by the FCRA or not? And so the definition of a consumer report is any report, written, oral, or other, um, that bears on a consumer's these seven categories, uh, any of these, credit worthiness, credit standing, capacity, character, reputation, personal characteristics, or mode of living. So it has to relate to uh, the, that kind of information and which is used or expected to be used in whole or in part for one of these purposes as, as a per for the purpose of serving as a factor in either uh, credit or insurance, employment purposes, or any of the other purposes that are listed in section 1681B, which is the list of permissible purposes for consumer reports in the statute. And when you look at that section 1681B, this is the list of permissible purposes that, that are included in the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Um, and, and some of them don't apply, but the one that definitely seems to apply here or seems relevant is to establish eligibility for government licenses or benefits. That is one of the purposes. And so if a report uh, bears on someone's reputation, personal characteristics, or mode of living. I would submit to you all of those are, are relevant here. And it is used um, as a factor in establishing eligibility for a government benefit. It seems like it should be a consumer report and should be covered by the Fair Credit Reporting Act. And why does that matter? If it is a consumer report under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, consumers have certain rights under that federal law. First of all, they have the right to access information in their files from the consumer reporting agency that provides that report. They're entitled to certain notices when information is being used against them in a decision. Um, and, and part of that is so that they'll be aware of the information that's being used against them and they can dispute it if it's inaccurate. Um, they also, these reports are only allowed to be used for certain permissible purposes and cannot be used for other purposes. And finally, this is in many ways the most important reason that it matters. If it is a consumer report, the entity that is selling this product has a duty to ensure maximum possible accuracy um, and also to investigate disputes. Maximum possible accuracy is not satisfied by first and last name match. I will tell you that. First and last name match has an enormous rate of false positives, as we said, um, and we cite to this in the report, and I can't remember the, the data 
uh, right off the top of my, my head, but there are hundreds and even thousands of people in the country that have certain common names like Robert Smith. Um, and, and so if you don't include another factor like a date of birth or social security number, it is not highly accurate and it's certainly not maximum possible accuracy. And so that's one reason why it, it matters to establish whether this is covered by the FCRA. So LexisNexis and the Social Security Administration have been taking the position that this is not a consumer report. They have been trying to argue that the Fair Credit Reporting Act does not apply to Accurant. And here's their, what I would submit is a very thin justification for that. The manual, the POMS manual, which is the program manual for the Social Security program, says that the Accurant report may only be used to establish a lead and says that the Social Security employees at the local field offices are not supposed to use the report alone as a basis for an eligibility or ineligibility determination. Instead, they're supposed to use it only to establish a lead, and then they are supposed to independently investigate whether the property really belongs to this individual or not. But as we have documented in this report, that is not happening in reality. Um, instead, people are being cut off of their SSI benefits or hit with an overpayment notice based solely on the information in, in the accurate report because most of the folks we heard about from legal services attorneys around the country were not contacted by the Social Security employee. And in fact, you know, when we have dug into this a little further, there's no information in the manual about how the Social Security employee is supposed to do an independent investigation other than contacting the individual. And if they're not able to reach the individual on the phone, it's really not clear what they're supposed to do to try to investigate this. They have a report on their computer screen in front of them that says Robert Smith owns this piece of property. And in reality, many of them are acting on that basis without you know, going to the deed records. And even if they went to the deed records and looked at the deed, they would still see the name Robert Smith. So it's really hard to think about how a social security um, employee would even do an investigation. And so what we've learned is that these reports are being taken as evidence in determining that someone may be ineligible for SSI. And we think it's extremely problematic I will tell you that there are legal questions about whether a company can avoid coverage of the Fair Credit Reporting Act by saying, we didn't intend to sell a consumer report to the government or to whomever. And there have been some recent cases, the Kidd versus Thomson Reuters case, which involved another LexisNexis product called Clear, which is a background check report, um, is one case in which for that product, uh, sorry, it's Thomson Reuters, they say, oh, this is not, we don't intend to provide a consumer report. And they have a lot of safeguards in place where they actually were reviewing how people are using the product. And if someone was using it for an impermissible purpose, they were terminating their the contract with that user. Um, so that in that case, the company went a lot further than just saying, hey, you can't use it for a prohibited purpose. Uh, but there's also the Zabriskie case out of the Ninth Circuit in which uh, it has to do with Fannie Mae's desktop underwriter program and people that were being improperly denied for a mortgage loan based on this Fannie Mae product. And then and the court ultimately determined that, in fact, uh, this was not a consumer report basically because of, of what Fannie Mae is and what they're trying to do. And they determined that they didn't intend to provide a consumer report. So there are some questions there. But through our research and what we have uh, described here and unearthed in doing this report, it's pretty, we have now, I think, presented the information to Social Security and to LexisNexis that, in fact, these reports are being used to determine eligibility. So we really think that both LexisNexis and Social Security need to change what they're doing in response to, to this information. Um, and I think, Kate, you're going to take us through some of our recommendations and then we can uh, open it up for questions. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, I'm just going to wrap up here by uh, going through our recommendations from the report um, for, uh, you know, changes we think uh, Social Security should make. Um, so first of all, you know, we think that LexisNexis and, and the Social Security Administration should acknowledge that Accurant is a consumer report and it's covered by the Fair Credit Reporting Act. 
uh, for all of the reasons that Sarah just laid out. Um, you know, that it brings additional protections uh, for folks and it's, it's very um, important to make sure that those uh, protections, you know, that people are, are uh, able to benefit from the, from the protections of, of, that, um, of that law. We've recommended that the Social Security Administration should stop using Accurant um, for uh, doing this kind of non-home real property data matching until a stronger matching protocol is in place, right? That we um, feel that this first and last name uh, matching protocol that they're using uh, turns up a lot of false positives and is not strong enough um, given the uh, really vital benefits that are at stake here for people. Uh, third, we said that um, the Social Security Administration should honor existing due process rights and enhance the due process protections that are provided, especially continuing benefits during appeal. So this is, um, you know, to make sure that um, people are contacted uh, before the agency takes any sort of adverse action, and that um, if they do file uh, an appeal on a notice, um, that they are, are given their rights for, for requesting a reconsideration, uh, especially continuing benefits. And as I had noted earlier, uh, folks can now um, continue receiving their SSI benefits uh, if they file their appeal within that 65-day window. Um, you know, it's, it's, it should be a given. Um, since this is a new change, it may require some advocacy at the agency to make sure this happens because it will require an, uh, an employee to take a manual action in their systems to, to get somebody's benefits turned back on. Um, but, you know, we, we think that um, this is, is what should be happening. Um, and, you know, we even heard about examples of people being told that even though they had filed their request for reconsideration within the 15-day time period earlier, um, that they were told by SSA employees that they were not allowed to get benefit continuation um, because, you know, the, the computer showed that they own this property, right? Somehow there was this excep exception to their constitutional due process rights uh, for, for owning non-home real property, which is, uh, ridiculous. There are no exceptions to a, a constitutional due process right for uh, benefit continuation, um, but unfortunately that is what some SSA employees think for some reason, so they were refusing to uh, turn people's benefits back on. Um, so we want to make sure that uh, the agency is, um, you know, uh, protecting, recognizing, uh, SSI recipients' uh, due process rights um, in these situations. And we feel that um, it's really vital for the agency to ensure that their employees are truly conducting uh, a thorough independent in, uh, investigation before they take any sort of adverse action uh, against SSI applicants and recipients. Um, you know, it, it can be, difficult. You know, we understand that the reason why they um, have turned to this product is to make things easier for their employees uh, to, to do this kind of um, investigation, but the tool that they are relying on is not accurate and is turning up too many false positives um, and that they are then, um, you know, really taking uh, adverse actions against people to the extent that um, you know individuals are in danger of becoming homeless, and you know they they lose their um, health insurance through Medicaid when their SSI is suspended as well. So these are really uh, vital, essential benefits for people that should not be uh, treated in a casual manner. You know, turning them on and off um, without a thorough inspection or investigation to verify that the person is actually not eligible. So now we have some time for questions. Great, uh, Sarah and Kate, thank you for such uh, incredible, great 
uh, information. This is a 90-minute webinar, so we have time for your questions. So get those questions to Nelson. Nelson, do we have any questions out there? Yes, we do. Can you hear me okay, Linda? Hear you just fine. Great. Um, we do have a couple of nuts and bolts questions just about what is countable, so maybe we can move through these quickly. Um, somebody's asking, if somebody, say, is in an accident and they win a settlement, how does that affect their SSI benefits? Does it affect them? Should the money be placed in trust? Right, so just receiving a court settlement in a, in a case like that is going to be a countable resource. And, um, you know, there are ways to uh, convert it to, an, uh, to a non-countable resource. Um, some people may be, it may be possible to set up a special needs trust. Um, you know, that's not something that I would ask the, the personal injury lawyer to set up for you. You really need to have uh, an attorney who specializes in you know kind of this uh, estate planning and knows uh, the ways uh, you know because there are very strict statutory requirements of uh, you know what the the trust documents need to say you know it needs to be irrevocable you know all sorts of things that that need to be in those trust documents to make it a special needs trust that will not be counted uh, for SSI purposes. And I will say those trusts are also only available for people who are under age 65. Uh, so SSI recipients who are uh, 65 and older cannot take advantage of a special need trust uh, to protect benefits like, to protect income like that or, or resource um, from being counted. Um, so, you know, there are limitations. Um, you know, if it's a, if it's a very large award, uh, or settlement, then it does make sense to pay an attorney to set up the special needs trust properly. Um, sometimes these these uh, settlements are quite small, um, and in those cases, it might not make f much financial set sense to try and uh, put them in a special needs trust. And in those cases, the person may just need a plan for spending down, as I mentioned earlier, spend, spend, spend. You know, but people, you know, should consult with somebody who knows the SSI rules, right? Personal injury lawyers are not familiar with all these rules for these benefit programs and how things count or don't count. So you would want to consult with an attorney uh, if you are anticipating a large settlement for from a personal injury suit. Thank you. I think really, this is maybe right on the same point. It says someone does someone does not need to report the income if it is spent before the following month. Is this well? You, right. You need to report it as income. Right. Okay. People people need to report their income on a monthly basis to the Social Security Administration for SSI purposes, um, and then SSA is going to follow up and ask. You know they're going to look at your bank account and balances and, and other resources um, in the following month to see if you've retained the income or, or right to retain the income into the following month to see if it would be counted as a resource. But you always need to report your income every month. Okay, so <clears throat> that may be the same here. A question is if I refinance a home and the equity the equity is used to pay a bill is it countable so, okay, so um, oh go ahead kate i will i was going to say that uh, this is probably also mostly for you but i was going to say so the home is refined in this scenario it sounds like someone has a home and they refinance the mortgage to pay off some other debt i don't think that would be problematic because the, the home that they own is not a countable resource, right? But the right. and the fact that they get they borrow some money against their home, that's not income and it's also not an asset. Is that fair? Yes, that's accurate. Yeah. Okay. Another question is can someone receiving SSI for a child buy a home? Uh, yes. So the parents of a child receiving SSI, there is what's called deeming where the income and the resources of those parents are deemed or counted uh, partially in, in calculating the child's SSI benefits. But again, the home that the parents and the child are living in are not gonna be counted as a resource for that child. 
Um, so uh, yes, the, the parents um, of a child receiving SSI are, it can buy a house for the family to live in and the child can remain eligible for SSI. Thank you. Another question is, why is the information asked about burial plots if they're not counted <laughs> during an SSI interview? Yeah, you know, they, they, they just want to know everything, right? They just want to know, right? Because there's, there's, they want to, they just want to know. Um, so they can make sure that it is titled in such a way that it's not countable. Um, so, you know, a lot of times I hear from people like, oh, I didn't think I needed to report that to Social Security because it's not something they're going to count. And it's like, yeah, they still want to know. Even if it's not something they're going to count, you still have to report it. Hmm. Great, thanks. Someone is sharing, and I don't know if you want to add anything, that EITC and CTC are excluded for 12 months. And also, a couple of people have mentioned ABLE funds. Uh, up to 100,000 are excluded as SSI resource, they're saying. I don't know if you have more information. Oh, yeah, I think that, thanks for people for correcting that. I think I had put the wrong, right, that, that retroactive benefits are excluded for nine months, but like tax refunds, earned income tax credit, uh, and child tax credit are excluded for 12 months. So thank you for that correction. And then, um, I'm sorry, what was the second thing you said? Was it something oh, called ABLE? It was ABLE. about ABLE funds up yes. to 100,000 excluded. Right. So um, this is, again, a, a not a countable resource. Um, it stands for Achieving a Better Life something Act um, that was pa passed a few years ago. Um, the limitation on setting up an ABLE account, though, is that the person um, who the ABLE account is being set up for um, uh, they, their disability has to have started before they turned age 26. So there's a limited pool of people, right? So it's not just anybody with a disability can set up an ABLE account and not have an account against their SSI resource limit. It's that um, they, it, it will only be excluded if their disability uh, started before age 26. Great, thank you. Uh, another question here, why do some clients receiving S SSI continue to get their benefits adjusted to where they are receiving less and less money, where they there have not been any changes on their income or assets? It's a mystery, yeah. So, you know, they should be getting a notice of planned action each month um, that's, you know, and it'll say, uh, you know, your uh, benefits are being adjusted um, based on your income, and they'll they attach uh, you know sheets that show their calculations. So it will show you uh, the countable income and then any disregards, um, and then say, okay, you're going to get $500 in December uh, because of X dollars of income in October. Right? That's something to keep in mind. Is that um, the amount of benefits that I receive, uh, say in November, is based on the income I had in September. So there's that two month delay in calculating the amounts. And that's to give SSA the time to send you a notice to tell you why the amount is being adjusted uh, in following months. And so you should be able to see at least the amount of the income that they're counting uh, when they send those notices, they're not always very informative in the notices about the source of income. Um, so a couple things to keep in mind. Uh, one is that S uh, SSI has the in-kind support and maintenance rule that will uh, reduce people's benefits by one third if they're receiving assistance with their food or shelter. Um, so that's a whole separate webinar that I've done many times, and I can uh, point people to those resources if they need to learn more about in-kind support and maintenance and how that will end up reducing people's SSI benefits. Um, you know, and other 
reasons people's benefits go up and down? You know, if you're receiving other uh, income, like from a pension or an annuity, if that amount fluctuates, um, you know, if you're uh, working and those earnings fluctuate, then that might impact the SSI, um, you know, especially for parents who are working and their child is receiving SSI. If the parents' wages are fluctuating, then that will, um, you know, through deeming, that has an impact on the amount of the child's SSI benefits each month. So, you know, just hypothesizing what, why somebody's SSI benefits might fluctuate um, due to income. And then there's also, you know, if somebody has an overpayment uh, and they don't dispute the overpayment, um, Social Security will start collecting 10% of their benefits each month towards that overpayment. So sometimes uh, we see that reduction, you know, somebody suddenly starts receiving $80 less in their SSI and they don't know why. It's because Social Security has, has started collecting an overpayment and the person hasn't understood the overpayment notices they've gotten from the agency. Thank you. Uh, someone's asking, what about recipients that own property outside of the US? Yes, that is non-home real property that counts against their resource limit, um, but that property is not included in the accurate for government database. So folks are supposed to be reporting that uh, property. Um, it won't automatically mean they are ineligible because I've seen many times where people own, you know, one sixteenth share in a farm in Costa Rica or whatever, and that that the value of that property, the share of the property that they own is less than two thousand um, dollars. but it is it is a countable resource. And they are supposed to be reporting it to the agency. And I would echo Kate there that it's true that that doesn't seem to be picked up by the accurate search, but it does come up. And I think sometimes people self-report and and there may be some other tool that uh, Social Security is using to try to find these um, non-domestic um, real property interests. But yeah, as, uh, I think it's a really good point that people's interest in the property may be less than $2,000, especially if there's some kind of mortgage or secured debt on the property, because keep in mind, only their share of the equity counts. So it's a good, good point. Great, thank you. Uh, someone mentions that SSI participants can participate in the homeownership program through housing. I'm not sure which program, but how would that person save for a down payment or possibly receive an escrow from the FSS program that housing offers to go towards owning the home? I think this is a really interesting question, and maybe I'll start and Kate can jump in because I do a lot of home ownership and access to home ownership work. Um, I'm wondering if this might be something connected to the Housing Choice Voucher Program or the DREAM Program. I know that there are programs in which people that receive Housing Choice Vouchers or Section 8 vouchers can use that voucher towards a more, as part of a mortgage payment rather than a rent payment, but the program really has been underutilized, and this may be one of the reasons. It, you know, Of course, not all housing voucher recipients are on SSI by any means. Many of them are working, but if it is someone who's an SSI recipient, I think saving for a down payment would be very difficult because until you actually put it towards the purchase of the home, that money in your bank account is a countable resource um, and maybe there would be some way to save it. Uh, I don't know, Kate, do you have any thoughts about how someone could save money without having it be? Uh, I mean, I know you mentioned special needs trusts, but that uh, is a certain amount of work to set that up. Yeah, it's, it's, I think this is a real barrier to home ownership for folks you know, applying for and receiving SSI, um, mm -hmm. you know, because any sort of savings is gonna count towards the resource limit. Um, you know, and we see this not just with saving up to buy a home, but then also with paying property taxes, um, mm. you know, that, that sometimes people have enough income. You know, we see this particularly with older adults who have perhaps paid off a, a, a mortgage on the home they're living in, but are still responsible for the property taxes. And some 
uh, jurisdictions require you to make payments maybe just once or twice a year on property taxes. Mm -hmm. So if they if they save up the money to pay those property taxes in a lump sum, it puts them over the resource limit and they get into problem, you know, they end up with problems with their SSI because of that. Oh, that is a great point. I would just point out too that if someone is eligible for down payment assistance, I don't think that would necessarily be a problem because if you get down payment assistance that is a grant from a nonprofit or community group, you know, it's paid and if it's paid directly to the to the seller for the purchase of the home, it then it, in theory has never it never passes through the hands of the SSI recipient. But yeah, this is a really good point about any money that you actually save towards home ownership or even paying property taxes is going to put the SSI benefits at risk. Thank you. And somebody just there shared that I guess through Able you can buy one home and one car. The, the what was mentioned earlier the the saving oh yeah and well buying a house is okay but i think the problem is the assets well oh you're talking about the able account right and i guess kate pointed out earlier that the able account is pretty limited in terms of who's eligible for it because they have to have become disabled before age 26. so it'd be great if that could be expanded and there is uh uh, a bill in Congress called the Age, Able Age Adjustment Act that would increase that up to age 46 and would mm -hmm. capture a, a lot more people. And, um, you know, we would love to see more people being able to take advan advantage of ABLE accounts. Mm -hmm. uh, a question here regarding the Goldberg Kelly notices, this change that was mentioned that the to 60 days. It said the Goldberg Kelly notices provide 10 days, which has been changed. However, the normal initial notices also give a person a 30-day time limit to keep a change in benefits from happening, even when they have 60 days to appeal. Has there been a similar change with this type of limit, similar to the 10-day 10, 10 limit? Uh, no, so I think they're referring to an overpayment notices. Um, it, it will usually say, you know, if you appeal within 30 days, there'll be no change, you know, we won't start collecting. Um, but you have up to 60 days to appeal. So if you file your your request for reconsideration on an overpayment notice between you know day 31 and and 60, then um, they should stop any collection that was started. So even if you you file the appeal on that overpayment notice. Uh, after the 30 initial 30 days, and they've started collecting the overpayment, that should stop once you filed the request for reconsideration on the overpayment notice. Great, thank you. Uh, someone also just shared that the Housing Choice Home Buyer Program is excluded as a resource since as the SSI beneficiary does not have access to the home purchase account. And then somebody is asking if uh, SSI recipients can save with a community empowerment fund savings account uh, that is under the name of CEF of the Community Empowerment Fund. Not sure if you have any more information on that. Yeah, I'm not familiar with those accounts. You know, as I mentioned, um, in the in the Social Security Program Operations Manual, the POMS, there are many, many sections talking about excluded resources so that it may be included in there. Um, but I'm not familiar enough with those accounts to know if they're included in, in the list of excluded resources at Social Security. Thank you. Um, someone here shared that in the past, Actrian also flagged ownership of tribal member interests in, in trust lands without any notes of the actual share and that it is held in trust by the federal government without any mention that those assets are restricted and generally non-saleable on the common market. Any idea if that has been fixed? Mm, yeah, this is a big problem uh, for for uh, members of tribal nations, and I am do not know if that has been addressed. Um, but I think there is definitely a, you know a strong legal argument to make that the person doesn't actually have access to those assets. 
Okay, thank you. Um, some of the simple question here is, do we know if SS, SSA chose to have accurate match only the names? So this is something that is probably designed by LexisNexis, but certainly SSA is aware of it. They were aware of it before our report and, and they're more aware of the problems now. Um, and Lexis sells a number of different products, some of which have higher matching protocols or more strict matching protocols. So SSA could elect to use a different data matching program. It seems like to some extent they want an over-inclusive search because they're so oriented towards uh, wanting to make sure they're aware of any potential real property. But as we've mentioned, that raises a host of problems uh, and there could also be a cost factor. I don't know whether some of the LexisNexis products that involve matching by date of birth or social security number, whether those are more expensive or not. Uh, but we do believe there's been a, a policy decision made to buy this product and use it in this way. Now, since our report, we, we have been talking with the Social Security Administration and there's, I think, reason to believe that they're aware of the problems with the way this is being implemented. And we're certainly all staying tuned to see if they're going to make some changes in a positive direction. Um, but we don't we don't know yet exactly what may happen, but they they seem to understand at least the fact that uh, the employees are not doing independent investigations and that they need to provide better guidance about how that would be done. Um, but no, as of yet, I, I think we're just, we know that they're aware that LexisNexis uses this matching protocol, not that they designed it that way, but that they elected to purchase this product knowing that it was designed that way. Thank you. Someone's asking uh, for the online um, account, does, does the claimant have to have their own online account set up to file the online appeal? No. Isn't that exciting? You do not have to go through the nightmare of setting up a My SSA account to use this. You need to have the notice. Right? It will ask you for the date on the notice. Um, so you need to have some information from the notice to enter in uh, to the um, portal there. But you do not, it is not behind the My SSA wall. So that's the good news. Thank you. It's nice to, nice to hear that. What do you do if you request reconsideration on an issue re requesting a formal conference, but you only get a letter affirming the prior decision without a conference or even just a phone call? Also, the worker refuses to speak to the recipient's attorney, even with a 1696 on file. Any thoughts? Oh, boy. Um, yeah, I mean, that's when you start making a fuss about due process protections and Goldberg Kelly and that they have to do their job. Um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to consult with people uh, about these particular problems, you know, particular, uh, yeah, should we call them bad actors, particular SSA employees who are not doing their job properly at local offices. I'm always happy to consult with people about those and help them escalate those at the agency. Great, thank you. Someone here is sharing, um, sharing their thoughts and a question here. Given how convoluted this process is, especially the accurate information, one would be better served by seeking help from an elder law attorney that specializes in social, in social security and SSI issues, they say. What, S, they say. what SSI has done literally borders on criminal and the fact that they can get away with it is outrageous, they say. How our, are our legislators, how aware are legislators of this practice? Or does it not warrant attention since the people who are affected are financially, medically, cognitively challenged and often lack, lack strong advocates? Any thoughts? So oh, I appreciate this comment very much. And I think the outrage that you feel is, we share that outrage and we do see it as a very significant problem. And, and that's why Justice and Aging and NCLC um, wrote the report and why Consumer Action wanted to have this webinar to, to help us publicize it. And we did send the report to staff of certain members of Congress and also to various federal agencies. So 
many folks are aware and are concerned. Obviously, there's a lot going on in DC all the time and no less so right now, but uh, I think there is some interest and I think we can look for opportunities to continue to call it into the light. Um, and Kate, do you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I'll just say that, um, you know, sometimes uh, individuals will contact their, their member of Congress their office for uh, constituent services if they're having a problem like this at, at the Social Security Administration, but those are just seen as you know individual problems, and they and the office may try and help them you know by intervening with Social Security to to fix their individual problem, but they don't really see the systemic problem. Um, you know they don't they don't look for uh, what's kind of going on behind the individual's problem. You know, they're not going to say, now, is this based on an accurate for government report? You know, they they just try and fix that individual's problem. So um, I think to the extent that uh, folks are able to, you know, bring this to the attention of their members of Congress as a systemic problem, not just an individual constituents problem, um, and that this, you know, requires uh, uh, a more systemic uh, fix than just you know, correcting the, the error that's made for one individual. And one just additional thought to add there is that we really need you all to be our eyes and ears on the ground on this. And um, Justice and Aging and NCLC are continuing to advocate on this. And one thing we're afraid of hearing is, oh, well, that, those examples are all from so long ago, and surely this is not a live issue. Um, we have reason to believe it is still going on and that the problems have not been fixed. Um, there was a little bit of a gap during the pandemic when uh, redetermination reviews were not happening, um, but we, we have heard of some recent examples. But please, if you become aware of an SSI recipient who's being cut off um, or having some adverse action taken, based on supposed non-home real property, please reach out to us. Um, and and we, we just, we need to continue to hear from folks about what they're seeing on the ground and that can help us push it forward. And just as we're, uh, you know, we've been focused on this particular data matching program today because we are so concerned about it. Um, the agency is, is expanding its use of data matching. Um, so if you are, you know, and we're also concerned about those um, data matching programs as well. So if there are other uh, instances where you see um, the Social Security Administration, um, you know, basically harming beneficiaries because of relying on, on data matching programs, we're interested in this in a, in a larger sense as well. Thanks so much. Uh, someone's asking, is, I mean, is, is there a reason why there hasn't been a class action? Is that something that might have been possible or is possible? It's possible, you know, as Sarah said, um, examples are helpful. Um, you know, we were really relying on our network of contacts at legal aid attorneys uh, to find out about these instances. And many of them, all of them are fantastic at what they do. So they were able to resolve the problems for their individual clients. Um, so it can be a little bit challenging um, to bring a class action on this issue because you need to have at least one person with a live issue, right, who is currently, you know, not receiving their SSI. Um, and so we never want to um, tell somebody, oh, you should wait um, and not receive your SSI while we get this class action litigation together. Um, so we always want individuals uh, problems to be resolved as quickly as possible, but then it makes it challenging for us to to bring class action litigation. So we're always interested in hearing from people who have examples and kind of brainstorming with them about how we might be able to identify individuals who have live claims. Great, thank you. Uh, someone's asking, if, and this might be quick, uh, if there's a citation to the rule that states that SSI recipients can receive their benefits pending appeal for being over-resourced. Oh, I mean, it's again, this is kind of like uh, the, the due process protections and the regulations apply to everyone, and there are no exceptions in the regulations or in the Constitution. So 
Um, right, there's there's no citation to provide to say don't do this. Um, uh, unfortunately, there's just the the regulation that says that they are supposed to pay people's benefits while their request for reconsideration is pending. Um, you know, I, I would be interested in hearing from from people if they're being told by employees in local offices uh, that SSA won't pay their benefits um, while the appeal is pending uh, because they have because they're over the resource limit or they're alleged to be over the resource limit. And Kate, you did put the link in the chat about the change from the 15 days to 60 days for that continuing benefit. So if I would just advise that folks look at the chat if you didn't see that link of that more recent development, which is a great, great one. So. Right. So that's the emergency message that was uh, is, uh, published on Friday, October 29th. Uh, can people, and, and uh, maybe ask just one or two more questions since we're over, but will, someone's asking, will checking your own LexisNexis report reveal any inaccuracies that you may have, or is this a unique version of the LexisNexis report that can't be checked? This is a huge product, a problem with the fact that LexisNexis is trying to argue that this product is not a consumer report. So. If it is a consumer report, as we think it is, you have the right to ask them for a copy of your file so that you could review it for inaccuracies and dispute any inaccuracies. Um, but of course, they're taking the position that this is not a consumer report. How I think that practically speaking, if you if you find um, someone who's impacted by this problem, they can write to LexisNexis and ask for a copy of their accurate report. LexisNexis does publish a whole bunch of different reports. And so they may get a, a dump of documents that includes more than just this one, but but I think people can ask for it. But I do think you know there there it's it is a little bit challenging because in theory, if they didn't provide it, uh, a consumer wouldn't necessarily have a have recourse. But I think in practice, some, sometimes they will provide it, and it's worth asking for. Thank you, Kate. Um, is a couple of people are asking, you know, if there's ways to maybe, if they want to reach out to you in the future to discuss ways to escalate certain issues, can can you be reached, or where do you, where do folks go for additional assistance with this? Uh, so this is Kate, and I will just um, share my email address and um, you know encourage people uh, to to uh, contact me with any questions about the Social Security Administration. Um, my email address is k l a n g at justiceandaging.org. So it's all uh, justice and aging one word with no caps is my email address, and I'm always happy to uh, consult with people on um, their individual problems with the agency. And I'm happy to share my email address as well, although I think Kate is probably the best point of contact for folks dealing with SSI cases because she knows this whole world up and down and backwards and forwards. Um, but my email address is smancini at nclc.org and I'm also happy for people to reach out, um, in particular if you have credit reporting or Fair Credit Reporting Act issues. Um, but uh, thanks so much to everyone for tuning in today and, and for keeping in touch with us moving forward. Thank you very much. Yes, we are over and there are lots of questions we didn't get to so you can get them to us or you can get them to our speakers and you know we'll try to get those answered. Thanks so much. Back to you, Linda. Thank you, Nelson, Kate, and Sarah. Thank you for sharing your report with us. Please join me in giving them the love. Believe me, I will be looking for ways to work with uh, you again. Uh, really quickly, this webinar is uh, presented with funding from Consumer Action Insurance Education Report. And before you go, I want to tell you about a couple of upcoming webinars that may be of interest to you. On the 11-9, we are hosting a, web, a webinar on the use of FinTech, and it's coming from a data network perspective. So if you're interested in helping your clients protect their privacy when using FinTech, you should attend a webinar. If you're working on student loan issue, housing issues, and government benefit issues, you need to um, join the webinar. 
on, on uh, December the 2nd, we will host a webinar on the rise of housing insecurity due to pre-existing conditions, COVID-19, and risky non-mortgage financial products that over a million consumers out there are using to buy low-income housing. And guess what? The protection that the average renter or homeowner receives, they are not receiving it. So we have uh, advocate coming in from Pew that will share that agency's uh, research on these uh, risky products. If you're interested in attendance, send me an email, hit me up, and I will hook you up with a VIP invite. My email is lynda.williams at consumer-action.org. If you're interested in donating to Consumer Action, uh, you can send us, you can go online, pay by credit card, a PayPal, you could just send us a check to Consumer Action at 57 Post Street, Suite 611, San Francisco, California. And last but not least, uh, the webinar is being recorded. You will receive a link to the webinar tomorrow along with uh, PowerPoint slides and a link to the report that was um, the subject of the uh, webinar today. And once you receive that information, you can help support us by subscribing to our YouTube channel. It is free and it would help us to continue to bring you these fantastic webinars. Again, a special thanks to Kate and Sarah. Again, please join me in sending them the love. And to our audience, we appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us. I still can't wait until I can see you in person again. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.